in the first century BC, there was a man named John, and we don't know much about John's early years, but we do know a lot about the world that John grew up in. Uh, Historian Tom Holland tells us that the world John grew up in was a very harsh world. It was a very brutal world. The Greek culture and the Roman culture had helped to shape this world. It was a culture where they believed that the gods fought among themselves, and that meant that people fought among themselves, and honor was found in conquest, and peace came by the sword. And it was a world that did not care if you were poor. If In this world, if you were poor, you were trampled on and taken advantage of. It was a world that did not care about women. Uh, The rights of women were virtually non-existent. It was a world that did not care about human rights. It was a world that did not care about the dignity of human beings. Human beings were not seen as special or unique. Uh, In this world, if you were not strong enough or rich enough or powerful enough, you were enslaved. It was, in short, a brutal world to live in. Historian Tom Holland, and that's not the actor Tom Holland, it's historian Tom Holland, uh, makes the argument that in the Western world, there are values that we hold on to that we think of as universal values. In other words, we have thought that all cultures hold these values, things like human rights, the inherent dignity of man, the, the obligations of the rich to help the poor. He says, we think of those things as universal things, But in reality, those things only exist in our world because of a man named Jesus of Nazareth, a man who walked the earth 2,000 years ago. And Holland argues that the world without Jesus is a world that exists in regions where uh, groups like ISIS or the Taliban have exerted control and brought with them a reign of brutality and violence. Holland argues that if we look at those regions of the world, we can see a glimpse into what the Roman world was like the world that John grew up in. Holland argues it is only because of Jesus and the influence of Christianity that we have adopted this idea that things like caring for the poor and safeguarding the rights of individuals and caring about the lives of the unborn and uh, kids who are being trafficked in various forms of slavery. It's only because of 2,000 years of Christianity that we think in terms of compassion and care and love. You see, Holland started out as an atheist, And as he started to write a history of Christianity, he eventually found himself being drawn to Jesus and he became a Christian. So Holland tells us that the ancient world was a brutal world and into this world came a man named Jesus and John met him and John became one of Jesus' followers and Jesus had a unique solution to the problems of this world. Jesus' solution was not more violence, Jesus was not one of those gods who advocated for violence as a means to solve the world's problems. Jesus' solution was love and compassion and kindness and understanding. And ironically, violence took Jesus' life. Jesus died a violent death on a Roman cross. And this person who preached about God's love and compassion and kindness, this person who preached, if, you, if someone strikes you on one cheek, then turn the other cheek and let them strike you there also. This man who preached, you know, those Samaritans who you hate so much, I want you to love them. Those poor people who you ignore all day, just love them and take care of their needs. That person who you despise so much that you won't even give them, you won't forgive them, you you can't find a way in your heart to forgive them ever for what they've done to you. Jesus said, forgive them or you will not be forgiven. This man, Jesus, who preached about the Father's love over and over again, was brutally murdered and struck down on a Roman cross and everyone thought, well, I guess that ends the nonviolence movement. I guess this idea of, of love just is not gonna work. Jesus is dead. But then Jesus rose from the dead and John became convinced. And John decided Jesus was God. Jesus was God come to earth to suffer and die for the sins of humanity and to show us as human beings a different way and a better way to live. After his encounters with Jesus, John said this. He said, the very nature of God is love. This is what John said after he met Jesus. Dear friends, Let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. And this was a radical statement in John's day. For John to write this is a radical thing because his listeners are thinking, okay, we live in a violent world. We live in a harsh world. 
We live in a brutal world and you are telling us that the answer to all of this is love? And John is saying, yes. That is exactly what I'm telling you. I have seen it with my own eyes. I have experienced it in my own life. And maybe John doesn't know how it's all gonna work out, but he does know this. After his encounters with Jesus, he knows that God is love. And anyone who does not love does not know God. What a powerful statement. John seems to be saying that people who come to understand that God is love, people who get that truth into the core of their being, those people know God and they are then able to love others. In other words, John is saying that God's love is the source of our love, that we don't know how to love without first somehow understanding this truth that God loves us. He writes, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. God's love is the source of our love. Now this very truth is what convinced Tom Holland to become a Christian. Holland wrote, wrote an article titled, Why I Was Wrong About Christianity. And in this article, he talks about this revelation that God is love and how that shaped and changed the history of our world. And he states, it took me a long time to realize that my morals were not Greek or Roman, but my morals are thoroughly and profoundly Christian. My morals have been shaped by this God who came to earth in the form of Jesus of Nazareth and lived and taught us the way of love and died on a Roman cross. I've been reading a book called Love Does. It's by a man named Bob Goff, and Bob is a lawyer. And in this book, he explores the idea of God's love and how God's love has inspired him and how it has changed his life. And one of the things that happened to Bob as he studied the Bible and as he thought about God's love is he started to realize that God's love was about action, that God's love was not passive, but God's love was active. And so in his own life, he started to take action. He started to focus on injustices that were being committed against children around the world. Uh, Bob and another lawyer went to Uganda and in Northern Uganda, there had been a civil war for 20 years. And this meant that the justice system had been crippled in that region and there were hundreds of civil rights cases that had not been heard. And so they asked, well, we're lawyers, can we help to try these cases? And they were told, well, none of the judges wanna travel up here. So he found some judges, convinced them to come into this very volatile region, and they went up north and tried these 200 cases. Along the way, they discovered that there were hundreds of young people being held in prisons uh, all over northern Uganda, and what had happened was these kids were being held in the worst possible prisons, old, dilapidated buildings, very little food, worse conditions than the other prisons, and someone would make a charge against one of these young people. In many cases, they were false charges, and the young persons, most of them boys, would be put in prison with no trial, with no hope of ever getting out. Bob went to one of these prisons and asked the warden, how many of these young people have been to court? The warden said, none. And they asked, well, how come? The answer was, we don't have enough gas money to get them to court, and there's no judges to hear the cases. So Bob convinced the judges to come, and they got some gas money, they tried these cases, in one jail, they tried 72 cases. 70 of them were wrongful convictions, 70. These young people, some of them had lost years of their lives all because they had never been to court and had the evidence presented. So they tried those cases, got those kids out of prison. And that is love. That's what God's love is like. But Bob didn't come up with this, own, this idea on his own. Bob got it from God. In the world that John grew up in, that kind of thing wouldn't happen. Those kids would have been left to rot and die in their prison cell. And as Bob began to contemplate God's love, God's love inspired Bob to love these kids and get them out of prison. God's love is the source of our love because love comes from God. John says God is the primary mover when it comes to love. We don't have any idea how to love unless we first understand that God loves us. John says, anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In other words, God initiated a movement of love. God looked down on the earth and he saw the condition that this world was in. He saw that human beings were selfish. He saw that the inclinations of our hearts were only to serve ourselves all the time. He saw that our main goal was self-protection and protection just for those around us. We were only looking out for ourselves. God saw the condition of our sinful hearts, 
The results of sin had wreaked havoc on the world and human beings could do nothing to save ourselves from our condition. So God moved and God acted. And in many ways, humanity was like those young people who were in prison. They were being held in bondage by the power of sin and there was no way out. Unless God moved first, there was no way out for us. We were stuck in prison with no hope of ever having a real and meaningful life. And then John says this, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And in these verses, John essentially gives us a definition of what he means by love. He says, when I'm talking about love, I'm not just talking about a feeling. I'm not just talking about an emotion. I'm talking about action because God's love is action. The kind of love that John saw when he met Jesus was the kind of love that goes out and does something because God's love is self-giving. John says, God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world. So, so this is love. Jesus is sitting in heaven. He is God. He is with God. Father, son, and spirit are watching the scene unfold on the earth. Okay, wow, this sin thing is out of hand. Look at all the children that are being harmed. Look at all the women that are being harmed. Look at the poor. Look at the plight of the poor. They're calling out to me for help, but I've given human beings free will. So what do I do? How do I help fix this? And John says that God's love causes him to send his one and only son into the world. God's love was not passive. At just the right time, God's love sprung into action and Jesus gives up his rights as God and he takes on the nature of a servant and he becomes a human being just like us. He enters into our suffering. He enters into our mess. He comes into this world, this brutal world, this violent world, and his coming changes the trajectory of the world. Think about this, if Bob Goff and his lawyer friends don't go into northern Uganda, those kids are still in prison. If those judges don't go north into this region that is violent and, and volatile and bring justice, those kids are still in prison. In the same way, if Jesus does not come to earth and show us the way out and die for our sins, then we are still dead in our sins. We are still in bondage, in prison to sin and death here on earth. So when we talk about love, Love is self-giving. Someone says, I love you. You say to someone else, I love you. Really? The test of that love is not just the emotional feelings of love or saying, I love you. The test of that love, if it is really love, love is self-giving. Love gives itself over and over again so that that person might truly know that they are loved. John defines love not by our human definition, but by God's definition. God's love is self-giving. God's love is also gift-giving. God's love comes with something to give. It isn't just, hey, I'm here, I showed up, you know, just checking in to see what kind of mess you're making of the planet. Um, I have to tell you, it's not looking too good right now. Um, maybe, maybe to try to shape things up just a little bit, just, just do better, okay? No, God shows up with something tangible to give. God sends Jesus so that we might have eternal life through him, Jesus shows up with this incredible gift of eternal life. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you're gonna have a joy in your life. It's gonna be like, like rivers of life just flowing out of you. And this eternal life, you get a taste of it here on earth when you put your trust in Christ, when you start to realize that you are loved and you, you start to have a different perspective about your troubles and your challenges that you're facing and you start to say, hey, this life is hard, this life is tough, but guess what? God has given me a new perspective. This life is not all that there is. There's an eternal life that is waiting for me in it. Even if things are not going great right now, even if this life is hard and this life is tough, I can know and trust that I have eternal life waiting for me. In fact, I have eternal life in me right now. And I will see it fully when I leave this life and when I enter into the next life and I see Jesus face to face. So Jesus comes with something tangible, the message that you can have eternal life. You can start to experience it right now and you can have it fully in the life to come. And then this is the key to entering into this eternal life because God's love is self-giving, God's love is gift-giving, but God's love is forgiving. You see, the main problem that we have as human beings is our problem with sin. And sin creates this barrier between you and God 
when you allow sin to enter into your life and you allow yourself to become bound up by sin, sin brings death, sin brings destruction. Sin is the main problem in your relationships, in your workplace. Sin is the cause of the brutal nature of the world that John grew up in, the world that Jesus entered into and, and the brutality that we still see sometimes in the world around us. Sin is the cause of whatever brutal things that you have experienced. Sin is the root cause of it all. And so John says, this is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Sin is the reason why Jesus came. You and I were like young, those young people in Uganda. We were bound up in a prison of sin and you were going to remain there for the rest of your life. But God said, no, I am not going to let that happen. I'm going to send my son and I'm going to make a way that your sins can be forgiven. So God, so Bob goes to Uganda. He does justice. He gets some lawyers. He gets some judges. They see that justice is done for us. God sends Jesus to pay the punishment for our sins. Now, in our case, we are guilty. We are guilty of sin, all of us. There's none of us here that have not sinned against God or against another human being. We're all guilty in the sight of God, but God sends Jesus to do justice. And at the cross, justice happens. And when we repent and we trust in Jesus, forgiveness happens. John tells us Jesus' death is a sacrifice that takes away our sins. In Uganda, Bob and his team were preparing for their first trial of 72 cases of, of young people in prison. And the judge shows up and Bob and the other lawyers show up. The family members show up, the kids show up. Some of these kids have been in prison for years without trial. And the parents had started to believe that their kids were guilty. And the kids, they had started to believe that their parents could never love them again, that their parents would never accept them again. And this is how the judge starts the case. He asks the children to leave the room and the children are ushered into another room and he speaks to the parents and he says, parents, forgive your children. Because the judge knew that whether they were guilty or not, these kids would not be able to move forward in their lives without the forgiveness of their parents. Then the judge walked into the other room where the children were and he says, children, your parents have forgiven you. And then the children went into the courtroom and they fell into the arms of their family. And they had received what they needed as much as they needed justice, they needed forgiveness. This is how we define love. Love is self-giving. God leaves heaven and he goes himself to suffer and die. Love is gift-giving. God brings with him the gift of eternal life. Love is forgiving. Jesus' death on the cross covers our sin, pays the price for our sins so that justice can be done and we can be set free from prison. That is the gospel. That is the hope that we have. And you might say, Steve, I am not fully experiencing that yet in my life. I'm still struggling. I'm still bound up in some ways. Sin still has its grip on my life in some ways. Well, I wanna remind you that your God has forgiven you. When the trial was over, Bob had some men remove the door to that, uh, to that juvenile prison. And he took the door back home with him and that door is still sitting in his office to this day. And that door is a reminder that God searches for us, that God is willing to go where, to where, whatever dark place we're in. He's willing to go to whatever door we are behind and he hears our prayers for forgiveness and he delights in forgiving us. And then he delights in answering those prayers so that we can come back home to him. And every time Bob goes back to that region of Northern Uganda, the warden of that prison says, you need to return my door. I need the door for my prison. He says, how can I have a prison without a door? And Bob tells him, you don't need a door because justice has arrived in this dark place and there are no prisoners to keep in. And that's what Jesus has done for all of us. All I can tell you if you're still struggling is that Jesus has already set you free. If you have called out to him for forgiveness, he has already pulled the doors off of your prison cell. But maybe there's some practical steps that you maybe need to take that can help you to walk out of that prison. There's some great Christian counselors in this city who would love to help you with some practical steps for how to walk out of that prison that you're in. There's a prayer team at our church that would love to pray with you and to help you to understand the freedom that you have in Christ and how to walk in that freedom. 
So that's God's love. God's love is self-giving. God's love is gift-giving. God's love is forgiving. Who does God love? God loves all people generally. When Jesus was asked this question, he answered it this way. And this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. This is John 3, 16 and 17. Perhaps the most well-known verses in the entire Bible. But this is the core of the message. Who does God love? God loves everyone in the entire world and he longs to see everyone saved and everyone know him. Also, God loves you specifically. God's love is personal. This is not just about something that's for everyone in general. This is about something that is for you, for you to experience at a personal level. In fact, God's love is so personal. If you took John 3.16 and wherever you see the phrase, the world or everyone in this verse, you can insert your own name. For this is how God loves Steve. He gave his one and only son so that Steve, who believes in him, will not perish, but will have eternal life. God sent his son, Steve, not to judge Steve, but to save Steve through him. God also loves your neighbor specifically. You could insert your neighbor's name in there. For this is how God loves your neighbor. He gave his one and only son that your neighbor, who believes in him, will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son to your neighbor, not to judge your neighbor, but to save your neighbor through him. You could even insert the name of the person that you love the least in the entire world. You could take their name, you could insert it in there. God also loves separated and excluded people. Is there anyone whom you have banished from your life? Is there somebody that you have separated yourself from? Maybe for good reasons, you've had to separate yourself from someone for a period of time. Maybe you have an enemy, someone you just can't stand. Maybe it's someone from work, maybe it's an old friend, maybe it's a member of your extended family. Look at this verse. This is one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. It's not a well-known verse. You, you might wanna mark it down and remember it. It's so profound. It says this, all of us must die eventually. Our lives are like water spilled out on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. But God does not just sweep away life. Instead, he devises ways to bring us back when we've been separated from him. That's the heart of God. That's the love of God. God pursues human beings, giving all of us every opportunity to turn to him, to trust in him, and to receive eternal life. So what does all this have to do with our city? Well, over a century ago, the city of Medicine Hat decided to change its name, and a man from Medicine Hat wrote a letter to a famous author and poet named Rudyard Kipling. And Rudyard Kipling had visited Alberta a few years before, and he'd been to Medicine Hat, and this man wrote Kipling a letter and he said, they're thinking of changing the name of our city. What do you think of Medicine Hat? Now, if you've been around the city for any length of time, you've, you've probably heard Kipling's response. He said, among other things, your city has all hell for a basement. All hell for a basement. And over the last two years, I've been thinking a lot about our city and about the identity of our city and the future of our city and thinking about that phrase, all hell for a basement. How does that phrase affect the identity of our city? How does that word spoken over our city affect the ethos and the culture and the environment of our city? Now, Kipling was talking about the natural gas deposit that, that had been discovered in this region, but still this phrase, all hell for a basement, is a statement of identity that hovers over our city. And we all know that the words spoken over our lives can have a deep and lasting effect in us. They did a study on this with teachers. Researchers took two different classrooms filled with ordinary average students. They told the teacher about one class, this is a brilliant class. And this class is the best class. The students are smart, they're a joy to teach, they're great learners. This class is gonna do well. And then they told the teacher, this other class, this is a tough class. They're average students, you can't expect much of them. They're gonna struggle just to get average grades. So the same teacher taught both classes. And sure enough, at the end of the semester, the class who had these positive words spoken over them had the better results. And the class who had the negative words spoken over them had worse results because it affected the teacher. It affected how she taught them. 
The class, she was told, was the smart class. She expected more from them. She taught them differently and they performed better. The class she was told was the weaker class. She was just happy if they squeaked by. So the words spoken over us have a powerful effect on our lives, particularly if we believe those words, if we receive those words into our spirit. So Rudyard Kipling said, you have all hell for a basement. And those words have been spoken over our city. And I've been wondering, what would God say about Medicine Hat? What would God say about this city? Hey God, what do you think about our city? If we could send God a message, what would he reply back to us? I've been pondering that for a few years now and even more so over the last few months, what does God think of our city? And I think based on what we've learned this morning, one of the first things God would say is I love the people of Medicine Hat. For this is how God loved Medicine Hat. He gave his one and only son so that everyone in Medicine Hat who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his son into Medicine Hat to judge Medicine Hat, but to save Medicine Hat through him. So this is what I think is God's heart for this city. Medicine Hat has all hell for a basement, but it can have all heaven for a future. God does not want our city to perish. God wants our city to have life, to have a great and meaningful life here on earth, but also to have eternal life. But this is what I'm afraid of. I fear that we are stuck in the first half of that sentence. Medicine Hat has all hell for a basement, and we're not yet ready to do what it takes to help our city to move into the second half of that sentence. We can have all heaven for a future. You know, what we're seeing as pastors is that there's more needs in our city than ever before. We're seeing an increase of family breakdowns. Marriages and families are struggling since restrictions were lifted. It's almost like the ordinary tensions and stresses of family life uh, were increased under pandemic restrictions. And now that the restrictions have lifted, that's resulted in, uh, you know, the, the release of that tension and it's led to separation and divorce in a higher rate than, than seemingly is normal. There, there's increased family troubles. And if you're experiencing that, let me say that you are not alone. There are many others that are going through this. And I want to encourage you, please reach out. Reach out to us for prayer. We have a prayer team who would love to pray for you after our services. Reach out to us as pastors. We would love to help you if we can. Reach out to one of your friends, to a mentor that you can trust. We're also seeing an increase of people who feel like ending their lives. The last two months, we have many families in our church and in the community who have been affected by mental health struggles and by an attempt on the part of a loved one to end their life. And in some cases, that person was successful. So there are families among us that are hurting and grieving and there are people walking around this city half alive because they are struggling just to get through one more day. And please know this, we want you to reach out to us if you are struggling. We've met, we have, we have some great Christian counselors in our city and we have some great pastors at this church who would love to listen to your story and listen to your struggle. We have Bible studies and small groups of people that care. Please reach out if you're struggling. We are here and we care. And then gas prices are on the rise. The cost of food is going up. Family finances are tight. We're told that the mustard seed is feeding 110 to 120 people for breakfast every morning. People who don't have enough money for a meal. Now this number is probably four to five times higher than it was before the pandemic. I'm also told that some people are doing very well, that some businesses are doing very well. There's some industries, some sectors of the city that are experiencing a boom and business is great and money is pouring in and people are going on vacations and life is great. But my question is this, how do we get the ones who are doing well to help the ones who are not doing so well? Because this is what John says after he writes his definition of God's love. He says, we are called to love others just as God loved us. He says, dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. 
So love is not only God's heart for our city, but love is God's mandate for us as we live in our city. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, if we take care of each other, if we have compassion on each other, if we help each other out, then God's love is brought to full expression in us and through us. How do we do this? This is just to get us started. I'm gonna be talking about this more over the month of June, our plans as a church to help reach our community. How do we reach our city? How do we love our city? But some quick thoughts before we go into communion. First of all, start by learning to understand the depth of God's love for you. That's where it started for Bob Goff. He, he stopped and started to think, what has God done for me? How did God express his love for me? And then he started to do the same thing. Maybe just stop and make some time every morning this week or every night before you go to bed and just think not about God's judgment over your life and what you're doing wrong, but think about God's great love for you. Maybe every morning read John 3.16 and insert your name in there and insert your neighbor's name in there and insert that person who you just struggle to love, insert their name in there and remind yourself, God loves me. God gave himself for me. God gave me the gift of eternal life and God has forgiven me. And second, love yourself, take care of yourself. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. In other words, you can't love your neighbor until you first love yourself. So take care of yourself, love yourself. Third, take care of people within the church. This is my fear. We have so many needs in our city among people who are not Christians, but we also have so many needs right now among people who are Christians. And so I want to encourage you, love yourself first, take care of yourself, but also take care of each other. If you know of somebody in this church who is going through a tough time, write a note, send a message, drop off a meal, bless them in some way. Let's take care of each other. Let's look out for each other. As we start once again to reach out to our city, let's not forget to care for each other. And finally, motivate each other to love and good deeds. The author of Hebrews puts it this way. He says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And I have more to say on this and we'll, we'll move to that over the, the coming month. Right now, I wanna turn our attention and our heart towards communion and invite Pastor Mike up to lead us through a time of communion. So as God continues to speak to you about his love and your love for your neighbor, I just wanna share a brief passage from Ephesians with you. And it says, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even we were dead in our transgressions. And it's by grace you have been saved. For it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. This is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Now verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So let's enter into this time of communion. I just encourage you, listen to what God is saying to you, what he's speaking to you right now.
I give my whole life to honor this love by the Lamb who was slain. I'm forgiven the sinner's Savior, crown him forever for the Lamb who was slain. He is risen. chains are gone and our debt is paid the cross has overthrown the grave for Jesus' blood that sets us free means death to death and life for Then Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he took the bread, he gave thanks. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do give thanks. We come before you and recognize that you are love. And Father, because of that love, you displayed it for us, not just through words, but in action when Jesus died on the cross for us to pay the penalties for our sins, the sins that we made, to pay for the punishment we deserve. But God, you loved us so richly that you did that for us. And so, God, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, for paying that penalty on the cross for our sins. And we magnify your name. We glorify your name. Amen. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So, Heavenly Father, we do proclaim your death until your return. And Father, may that be a part of our lives, to always recognize that, always recognize that sacrifice you've made on behalf. Help us always to recognize this, God, that you didn't just love us in words. You didn't just give us the Bible to have a nice, have a nice book to read about the love that you show us, but God, you showed it in action. You lived your life for us, you died for us, and you rose again for us. So Father, I pray for us as a church a church here in this building and watching online. God, may we be a people, not just of words, but a people of action, who display love, who show love, even to our enemies. God, you call us to love. So Father, give us the wisdom, give us the strength, give us the courage we need to live that kind of love. And may we glorify you in all things. Pray this now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. Well, this being the first Sunday of the month, we also take a community cares offering. And we take this offering to express our love in action. So if you, uh, if you feel led, you can, uh, you can give at the back as you're leaving. And this community care offering goes to different organizations and people that need your love, need your help. So take, um, uh, take advantage of that. As well, I know God has spoken to some of you, and some of you need more time with the Lord. So I encourage you to go back into the prayer room. You can pray by yourself, or there's people there who want to pray with you. But take this moment, take this opportunity um, to speak to the Lord. Continue to hear what he's saying. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, and may he be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. And may he give each and every one of you his perfect peace. Amen. Have a wonderful week.